um, hand it over to my amazing speaker, who is a great artist. As you can see, this is one of his pieces, and he's going to get into all of that. Um, and he's going to talk about his art. And what I want to point out, he's got an amazing week coming up because he's giving this lecture. It's also his birthday tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> and he also has an art show that tomorrow. we're going to post tomorrow <laughs> that we're all post about so you guys can all, and he has information here too, um, to check it out and tell your friends. But uh, please, everyone, give a warm welcome to Trey Isaac. Yeah. <laughs> How's everyone doing today? Good. 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 Okay, it's nice to see that we're awake, at least a couple of us. I think it's just about <laughs> six, I don't know about you all. Thank you again for uh, making the commute all the way out here, skating and sliding and whatnot. I hope it wasn't too bad for all of you. My Lyft driver pretty much made sure I was straight, so I was in the back seat. But anyway, um, yeah, this is my uh, first public speaking engagement, uh, specifically regarding what I'm going to touch on today, which is Magic Remote. Trey as it presents to you, and surreal life, okay? Um, as we go throughout the slides, um, this isn't anything that I copied off of Google or Wikipedia, well, on the slide is. But anyway, outside of that, everything is pretty much from a personal perspective in terms of how I feel surrealism is, how I apply it, how I use it, and how I feel it's applied and used in today's life as well. So all the content is original. It's a little mini art show because all the slides have my artwork in the background. So, yeah, let's go ahead and go through this. All right. First of all, who am I? All right, my name is Trey Isaac. Woo, sex, dizzy. All right. I am driven by a genuine passion for manifesting awe inspiring and psychologically empowering pieces of art. Based on my life as a person who has had to find power through loss and peace through discomfort, primarily raised by my grandparents. Losing my youngest brother and mother to cancer in my mid-teens were and still is the primary fuel to the fire that I use to push myself to create and provide for my family through art and art alone. What inspires my psyche is the need to do and be greater for myself and those around me who I in turn inspire and motivate. My artistic inspiration derives from the aesthetics and cultures of ancient Egypt, India, and Japan for the most part. I uh, take those inspirations and combine them with the philosophies and little lessons that I've learned and developed to create the images that I do to this day, okay? So that's pretty much the overall spiel of it. Um, I'll be 29 years old tomorrow, so fairly young, mid-aged, well, I don't know what you want to call it. But, um, yeah, I'll trip about it when I'm 30. But yeah, um, I've been creating going on 13 years now. So I started when I was about 16. I was uh, painting on my t-shirts and painting. It's nothing this elaborate or that sloppy. But it was kind of like just like little patterns and things. I got tired of wearing beauty supply clothes and foot like t-shirts and just playing to school. So let me get some paint, do a little something. It was never really anything major until I turned about 18 or 19. A couple of my buddies were starting to ask for some garments to be customized. And then I don't know what, what I can tell you exactly what became. Can we see um, the back of your shirt? Oh, yeah, you sure can. my hair out the way. <laughs> so um, what pretty much inspired me to move on to canvas was throughout me creating my clothes, I started to find that people only wanted the garment just for garment price, meaning if I wanted to express such a hell of a profound piece of art and put it on a t-shirt, they wouldn't appreciate the hell of a profound part because I don't know this t-shirt, it's 20 bucks, right? Oh man, this is like 50, 60 dollars, it is art. So, I kind of got tired of those battles of frustrations and just inadvertently said, F it, I'm just putting on canvas so you can appreciate the art for what it truly is. And if you want to invest and purchase, then you can invest and purchase for the genuine art as opposed to on a garment. You can easily take it off, throw it on the ground. No. All right. So <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, pretty much what inspired my move and my push transition to canvas art specifically. Shot black. Oh my god, I got a I love it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've had to play with all of those. Okay. Um, got some artwork in here in the background. What is this piece called? It's called Her Glory. I created this piece last year. It was a commissioned piece. Um, picked it right here. It's a uh, beautiful queen. You really can't see it because it had to kind of like dim it down. But her skin is a nice purple tone. I got real nice bright metallics going on just to kind of keep you uh, visually engaged. Flowers, as you can tell are uh, one of the main staples of my works. It uh, adds a feminine flair to my mostly masculine, sharp lines and everything. Kind of like a necessary balance, if you will. Um, 
as you'll see throughout all the slides, I'm not afraid to play with colors and putting anything together, even though throughout my career and as I kind of evolved and grew, I kind of stuck with a certain color palette that I, you know, personally prefer. So I'm moving on. All right, this is the Google slide right here. Okay, what is surrealism? All right, the definition I copy and pasted. Surrealism is a cultural movement that began in the early 1920s and is best known for its visual artworks and writings. Artists painted unnerving and logical scenes with photographic precision, created strange creatures from everyday objects, and developed painting techniques that allowed the unconscious to express itself. Its aim was to resolve the previously contradictory conditions of dream and reality into an absolute reality or super reality. Okay, that's the Wikipedia stuff that you can go find on your own, but I just have to make sure I added that in there, okay? And of course, the piece in the background is not mine. That is a piece of Salvador Dali, The Temptation of St. Anthony. And this was just to kind of give you guys a more <clears throat> general example of surrealism in terms of the exaggerated legs of the animals, how they, you know, for the most part, they're aesthetically correct in terms of the proportions of like the heads and the bodies, but the surrealness comes in the exaggeration of the limbs. The surrealness comes, it's a very bad picture I chose, excuse me, but um, it's carrying a whole palace on one of the elephant's bags, a statue of a woman, you have a floating island over here, a lighthouse on the back of the elephant. That's like one of the main photos of surrealism. And I was like, okay, yeah, I feel like this nails the point. And then I'll just go ahead and support it all myself. So yeah, all right, moving on. Okay, purposes, the reason why, what is surrealism for? Okay, it is used to tell in-depth stories, express emotions you would otherwise keep buried, childhood, personal struggles, evolving and developing philosophies, um, it's used to liberate the imagination, free your mind, create without bounds, disregard the usual, manifest your own world, and also to tackle hot topics from your genuine perspective, political opinions, cultural statements, and whatnot. So surrealism has its purposes and its ways and its means in life in the past and today as well. And throughout this uh, presentation, I'll go ahead and break down all of those in depth. Okay, and of course. A little brief art show in the background. This clip of a piece I did called Masters of Madness from the year 2013. Um, you can kind of tell here that my style was very much more loose and less constructed. Um, I'm not afraid to say I was a bit of an impatient creator back then. I was like really in a haste and a rush to get to the end product. Uh, get to the end product that I saw in my head. So I'm to hurry up get these lines all roughed out. I call it, you know, kind of like roughing out or rough style and not. But as my work evolved and as I grew up as a person, so did my work and my level of patience as well. And you'll see that as we progress through the slides. Sure, what I think is interesting too is just oh, that, okay, that picture that um, with your painting and then following the Dali painting, like with that, the swirls kind of having that surreal mm -hmm. element, those, I think that's really like interesting how you can see that you're developing still in that same. Yeah, some of it, yeah, yeah. But um, I'm glad you made me go back because uh, one of the reasons I called this painting uh, Masters of Madness was obviously there's a, a contrast between the two faces and expressions. You have a guy over here who's laughing, chuckling real hard with his eyes closed. You got someone over here that's like roaring passionately real loud. So it's like a contrast and duality of personalities. If you uh, look a little bit more in depth, excuse me if the colors are a bit too dim, but the colors that I use for the hair, the mustache, eyebrows and whatnot are the same colors I use for the face in the other one. The hair, mustache colors are the same one I use for the face in that one. So that was like a play on the title of the piece, Masters of Madness, a method behind the madness. So I made sure I had small, little intricate and large details that expressed and kind of like brought home the title of the painting. All right. I didn't mean to do that all the way over, but it did. So anyway, <laughs> just fast forward throughout this. Uh, uh, all right, here we go. Next slide. Storytelling, all right? Busy text. Surrealism can be a tool to manifest stories of struggle, triumph, love, found, or loss, etc. Certain elements can be added or exaggerated that otherwise wouldn't exist in real life to properly express the intended message. So, kind of like going back to the Salvador Dali painting that I uh, just showed you all. Say, for instance, I wanted to create a piece uh, expressing a great heartbreak that I had from a loved one. 
a surrealist perspective from that would maybe be uh, someone taking a pistol and painting a huge hand coming out of it and the hand goes through your chest and has your heart in this hand like that's like some very strong depictions of what it actually feels like that you would not see in real life like it may feel like that in your mind like, oh, wow she just literally took my heart and ripped it out from my chest but you know she did it figuratively or he excuse me so yeah um that's like an example of the storytelling that can be used in surrealism and how artists uh, back then and today kind of use it in their art okay and for the art show piece we had Rise of the Pharaoh that I did back in 2014. This piece depicts a uh, three-headed elephant, which uh, in Indian culture is called an Aravada. Um, they're mostly depicted uh, with white or ivory colors. I chose a turquoise and red because this was a time in my life where I was kind of focusing and identifying on a specific color palette that I liked, which was predominantly uh, red, purples, and turquoises. I feel like those colors just dance nicely together and they just, they look good, you know, good. Purple and turquoise looks good by itself. Red and turquoise looks good by itself. Red and purple look good together. It's just a nice marriage of colors in my opinion. And um, as you can see, as a huge contrast in the piece that we just previously saw, you can kind of tell my style is beginning to be a little bit more matured and tighter. Um, the little cubism uh, triangles in the background, those are much more well constructed. Even though the lines around the elephant are loose, they have a little bit more tightness in them. So this was a time in my life where I was starting to like breathe, take my time. If a piece takes me five plus days, it doesn't matter as opposed to I need to get this done in five hours. So I was, you know, getting the girl mature in that sense. Oh, it snuck up there, tucked away as a uh, pharaoh depicted riding on the elephant. I don't know if you can see that yeah. all the way up there. Um, that was a representation of me, okay, uh, riding on the Aravada. The uh, purpose of the uh, three-headed elephant and the relevance to it in my life, I use it as a representation for my vessel, my actual physical body. Um, throughout my years, I used to be a boxer when I was younger, from the age of 8 to 16, so I had to treat my body as a temple, literally, and I still do to this day, you know, exercise. But, uh, <laughs> um, and then even to this day, I've been blessed and privileged to be respected in my field and respected in my craft. So, you know, when I go out and see familiar people, I'm always greeted very warmly, very kindly. People are always happy to see me. I'm always happy to see other people. So kind of like, in a way, how elephants and other cultures are respected and appreciated and held in higher regard. So I kind of just took that and held as my spirit out. Okay, so, yeah, over Shakalaka. Moving on. All right, up flashing. All right, the ultimate place to vet. Less dizzy text, there we go. Artists are known to be primarily emotional beings who thrive on their own trials in life that in turn are used as the fuel to manifest some of the world's greatest works. So realism is the outlet to which an artist's most explicit and wildest thoughts and feelings can be openly expressed without judgment. Well, I mean, people judge anyway, but for the most part, without judgment, okay? Um, as I was telling you earlier, um, it's pretty much like a storytelling method. And in terms of people who are, you know, challenged maybe with mental issues of some sort, we may all some battle throughout some type of anxiety or depression. Art is a therapeutic form to get over certain emotions, to get over certain feelings like that. And a lot of artists, mm -hmm. old and new nowadays, they lean on their art, they lean on their painting, and especially surrealism, because you can take ideas and concepts and those deep internal feelings, and even if you don't have a real life image to represent it, you can manifest your exact feeling using any image in any type of way that you like without judgment. <laughs> All right, moving on. The piece in the background here is a clipping of Deliverance that I did in 2015. Um, it's a clipping of an entire photo that I'll go ahead and explain what you see now. Uh, there's two huge golden hands, as you can obviously tell. They both have uh, eyes and pupils and palms to kind of represent a uh, omnipresence of an all-seeing being um, as God of the universe would be. And coming from the hands is a nice flower with a gem coming from it to represent the deliverance of nature and the deliverance of divinity and the deliverance of all things great and glorious down to us. Um, and then stylistically, you can definitely tell much more now. I'm using hard lines, everything's nice and steady. I'm growing up in this one. So, <laughs> this was 2015, so me personally, I, I'm a huge critic of my work, as we all are. I was like, 
yeah, I like the direction in which I'm going. You can kind of tell I'm starting to get a little bit more disciplined and tired with my color selection and choices, not just wild or erratic with it. So uh, yeah, just a little natural progression of my own personal style. Okay, moving on. There is no box, okay? One of the greatest qualities of art is the fact that there are no rules. With surrealism, creators never boxed in what they are allowed to manifest. This boundless medium provides artists with a lane to create their own laws and express their own principles without the need to be correct, politically correct, or me trying to create a piece to please all of you. Like, no, I'm making this for me. And however you feel is based on whatever you feel. So that's one of the other advantages of surrealism. And it kind of ties into the uh, previous slide in terms of it also being a form of therapy because one of my favorite things as an artist, nobody can really tell me what to do. I was just explaining to Anna earlier that uh, when I'm creating about 85% of the time, I already have like the finished product in my head. It's just all about what styles and techniques I only use to get there. And that's not, you know, necessarily using a reference. Like, oh no, how did Dali do his? How did Picasso do his? Oh no, mine isn't finished. It's finished when I say it's finished. Okay, so for the most part, I've been uh, blessed to be able to determine when the piece is done, throw my little stamp of signature on there. But however, as it relates to this slide, um, that's one of the things I enjoy. No one can tell me what to do, how to create, and for the most part, as I've developed and uh, evolved as an artist, I've gained a style and aesthetic that's visually pleasing to most of the people who come and view my art, which is great. Thank you. Okay. And um, the piece behind here is called Fireworks. Majestic <laughs> did this in 2016. Okay, um, Definitely much more tightness, cleaner lines. Um, in this piece, I'm kind of playing with my blended style and my hard outline style because this is a point where I was like, oh wow, if I take my time, I can really make some nice lines with this paintbrush. So I was like tied all into that. You see my floral pattern, very defined and pronounced in the background. It's like different cuts that kind of like go from blended to outline, blended to outline. The uh, dragon here that's depicted, he has uh, crowns in his eyes. Usually when we see some cartoons like back in the day, if uh, you wanted to depict someone was dead, you paint X's over their eyes. And that kind of like became a style of art, especially like uh, Cause does. And I kind of wanted to take that and give it a positive flip. So I gave my dragon crowns inside of his eyes. So he's always focused on glory or the kingdom or whatever type of message you want to take from that. And uh, nicely, neatly tucked away, he has a third eye um, in the middle of his forehead to express and show a form of enlightenment, uh, to know exactly where he's going and how he's moving and everything like that. There uh, are more flowers represented as the wings of the dragon. Again, this is just a clipping of a much longer piece, so I just made sure I got the nice, tight, appropriate part, all right? Moving on. Unapologetically piercing, okay? Like Thank you. <laughs> surrealism. Just like all other mediums of art, surrealism is one of the top styles used in thought-provoking artwork that is used to address hot topics dealing with politics, race, economics, and day-to-day -day life as a whole. Many artists, past and present, have taken the liberty of expressing some of the most profound viewpoints in both popular and unpopular opinions throughout history. If you think about uh, propaganda, promotion, if you think about anything that kind of like takes something and exaggerates it, it's kind of like, especially like Donald Trump, they tear him up in the comments. That's actually a perfect example of what I mean by this slide, unapologetically piercing. You have no one in mind, you have like, you disconnect from what you believe would be everyone else's opinion when you're creating your piece because you literally want to get this subject or you literally want to get this certain viewpoint off of your chest that you go throughout all mediums and bounds to make sure it's manifested in the way that you want it to be and also portrays the message that you want it to say as well. So that's also another advantage of surrealism and how it's used in today's world and you know, back in the day as well is when people would take certain characters or take certain beings and stretch and elongate the faces and things like that. And kind of like do real crazy stuff with the artwork to get some hell of a message by. And the piece that I used for this one is called Woman God Queen. And I created this in uh, 2016. And it's uh, part of a uh, two piece. And the other one was a uh, Man God King. 
but I chose this one specifically, you know, I like ladies. <laughs> so yeah, I chose to put this one aside. And um, again, much more mature, uh, mature, cleaner style with the artwork. Lines are definitely tighter, cleaner. You can tell over my white, I went over it maybe two or three times to make sure it was nice and bright. In the previous slide, you can kind of see some of the color through the background. So I was definitely starting to definitely like lean on patience and taking my time. Execution is like one of the main things that I try to pay attention to when creating my pieces because I'm a huge critic. I make sure I, I wrap the edges on the side, including the bottle, and make sure all my lines are nice and tight. You don't see anything through the background. Um, real strong metallic colors. You can't tell because it's a flat image, but I use like a puffy 3D paint around the letters to make sure they kind of uh, are bright and feel like they actually move and come off of the canvas. Okay, moving on. Thank you. <laughs> In surreal life today. Uh oh, that looks fast. There we go. Okay, I'm going to stop. All right. <laughs> Surrealism is expressed today in many forms and many mediums, movies, the CGI, special effects. That's technically surrealism because we want to see Avengers in real life or we want to see certain <laughs> horror movies in real life, The Matrix in real life. All of those are actually examples of surrealism through cinema, if you want to think about it like that. Uh, cartoons. Hot Bugs Bunny, you no know, talking rabbits out here. That's surrealism <laughs> at work, okay? Um, it's more subtle. It's not uh, expressed or presented. We go, this is a surrealism cartoon. Come on, it's a fun cartoon meant for enjoyment and entertainment. But however, the main premise of it is all surreal. Mostly all the cartoons that we see in all the media that's not like real life TV is an expression of surrealism, okay? Uh, graphic novels, comic books, that's pretty much self-explanatory. You have uh, creators and artists who are pretty much boundless to the universes and the worlds that they can create. And, you know, in turn, when you open up that book or comic, you're pulled into that same world and universe, and however long you're reading it, you're like, oh, wow, this is really cool. Oh, damn, real life. <laughs> so, you know, like, surrealism is expressed for that as well. Um, technology. Technology is a form of surrealism. I mean, if you think about it, technically, if I showed you a Dali painting and there was someone holding a device in their hand and they could see their face, you're like, that's not real. But in a sense, that's surrealism as well because we're able to bend and manipulate reality with the technology that we use today. It's gonna to take this video and be able to replay it. That in its own form, if you want to be technical, is a form of surrealism through cinema and through art like that. Um, propaganda and promotion, okay? Kind of like piggybacking off the uh, previous slide in which surrealism is expressed in. So surrealism in today's world is expressed through all those mediums. And um, in this piece in the background right here, it is called Isaac Park 64. Okay? <laughs> I did this piece in 2017 in uh, preparation for a show that I did in 2018. It was called Lord of Nostalgia. And in that show, I uh, challenged myself to tie myself into certain scenes and certain elements of pop culture in the 80s and 90s that I personally relate to. One of my big things as an artist is to never create art for the sake of art. Like I was just telling the ladies earlier, I'll never take a canvas and just paint Bart Simpson and Batman just because I think Bart Simpson and Batman is cool. Me personally, I need a certain reason or a specific purpose to do things like that. And because of such, my catalog really doesn't have anything that's like pop culture related. I make sure I try to challenge myself to create original pieces or original elements, original characters that you wouldn't necessarily see unless you manifested them yourself or you know, kind of see my style uh, somewhere else. Which is why on the other side you saw elephants, you saw queens, you saw flowers, you saw huge hands. I try to make sure I create as original as possible. So with this collection specifically, I was like, all right, let me kind of give the people what they want and, you know, give them some of the cartoons and some of the movies and things. So this is one of the pieces that I use. And the part where I come in is this fellow right here. <laughs> you can't really tell, but the black outline right here is my box flying in the air. I got some nice cool rims on my Mario Kart. <laughs> just driving around, trying to get past Mario. He looking back at me. Um, this is actually a people's favorite piece from the collection because of how close it looks to like, oh my man, you painted that. <laughs> it looks like it came straight from the TV and from the video game, okay? So um, yeah, that's pretty much a nice little chronological order of my style of art, how I kind of evolved from very loose style, and this is tight right here. <laughs> like everything's nice and blended, and it's all acrylics too. People 
be surprised when I tell them it's acrylic, but you really got to sit there and have those colors and blend them. Like, my pads look like this because I'll do dark brown, hurry up, get that dark brown off, get the light brown while it's still wet, just to make sure I get those nice transitions. I've experimented with oil paints. I just prefer the challenge of the acrylic some more. So, and it dries quicker. So yeah, there's that. And um, yeah, that piece was created in 2017 by yours truly, of course. Okay, and then last but not least, as we were briefly mentioning earlier, okay, tomorrow is my birthday, I'm 29, and I'm presenting an art show called Get These Hands. Okay, so the reason the art show is named such because throughout my almost 13 year career, I've tried to adapt and develop certain elements that are known to me specifically. It's like my flowers, my elephants, my dragon that you just saw, um, the way I execute and create my hands. This show right here is going to be a huge entire study on hands and different hand gestures. And one of also the uh, real special parts about this show that you will hopefully come out and see around is uh, everything's in black and white. Okay, um, that was another thing I wanted to challenge myself to do was make everything black and white. I love color so much. I like, like I said, my reds and turquoise, how they bounce off of each other. Let me throw some gold and copper in there, but this collection, every piece, black, white, grayscale, even the signatures are black and white. I want to cheat and use gold paint. Nope, not even for that, okay? <laughs> um, as you see up top, I call it the first of the divine dozen. Uh, one of the things that I'm also challenging myself to do this year, and I'm going to do, is every month throughout the, uh, throughout the whole calendar year, I'm going to be releasing a new collection, a new body of work, featuring different studies and exaggerations of all those elements that I expressed earlier. So after this show, I'm going to do a show next month called She is God, in which I'm going to depict all beautiful women painted. I don't know what color scale I'm using yet. But, uh, very beautiful women and different scenes and whatnot. It's going to be an entire study on women. The following month, I'll be doing a show entirely based on elephants. The following month after that, it'll be a show based on dragons. The month after that, um, I recently got a thing for Japanese kanji and samurais and things like that. So, literally, throughout the whole calendar year this year, I've been releasing new bodies of work that isolate and focus on specifically those elements. And I call it the Divine Dozen because it's 12 months in a year. All those shows going to be a challenge for me to do, and yeah, I consider that pretty divine because I don't necessarily think any of my personal peers or anyone has tried to do anything like that. So yeah, the divine does get these hands. Um, the uh, information is right down there. I don't know if you want to take a picture or anything. I have cards if you would like to collect them. But it's going to be at a Bushnell Congregation Church, 15,000 Southfield Freeway, just down the uh, Grand River. If you want to take the scenic route, and um. Yeah, that's about it. And if you want to find out anything more about me, Trey Isaac, okay, all my info is on www.treyisaac.com or all social media, Trey Isaac. Um, I sarcastically made the A's in different colors because some people like to put two S's in my name and it looks so nasty. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, even when I write it, I like exaggerate and capitalize the A's, kind of like how you see in the uh, signature. So yeah, um, hopefully I didn't take up too much of you guys' no, time. we're going to do a and, um, Q&A if anyone has yeah. questions. That was my question, why you have the A's. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, as a sarcastic reminder, like, no, this is how you spell it. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. Um, so Trey, one thing that I thought was really interesting when you were talking about the canvas, um, kind of in the sense of the work that, in your mind, the work is complete, mm -hmm. um, and you're just, Kind of revealing it and getting it there, which I think um, it's really interesting that some artists sort of approach art that way. Like, I think it was Michelangelo that said, you know, the sculpture lived within the marble and he just revealed it. Um, do, you, do you find that to be a, a struggle sometimes, though, that you already have this end goal in mind and that the journey isn't taking you there? Or is it just that you have to be more patient and just have to get there? Just the patience, um, being able to make sure that everything is executed properly, all my colors are solid. If I'm working at angles, making sure everything has nice appropriate proportions and things like that. Certain challenges that I make sure I, you know, carry throughout my art. I try to make sure, at least me personally, that everything is easy. I always want to like, come stumble upon a bump in the road so I have something to overcome and I 
feel a little bit more gratification with the piece. Um, in terms of uh, patience and knowing when it's done, um, yeah, like I said, I kind of go into the canvas kind of like already knowing what I want to do. It just, the fun part is, all right, how do I want to make backgrounds specifically? Am I going to use textures? Am I going to be flat? Will I be using um, a whole lot of hard lines? Will I just keep it sweet and simple? Yeah. You know, things like that. Cool. Um, Billy, off that question, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about your thought process or how you decide okay, this is theme or this is what I'm going to do going into it? Okay, um, that's a very interesting question. In my mind, um, I don't know if you read my Q&A on the uh, website, but I literally do not have a lack of inspiration. Um, there's channels and flashes of a bunch of stuff going on in my head that I just want to create. Like even right now, I, there's so much stuff I want to do that's not related to get these hands or anything the divine does. It was like, all right, I got to be patient because of what I'm challenging myself to do now. Um, but when I specifically sit down and with a fresh blank canvas, I'm kind of cheating because throughout the day or throughout the week, I've already thought about it or I've been taking myself through the steps or how should this look, what colors do I want to use, do I want to blend them, do I want to block them separately. Um, the part where I have to kind of more so randomize that process is sometimes when I get a book to do live paintings and I just bring a canvas, just throw down like whatever on the spot. But even then, I still have, like I was expressing earlier, multiple elements and things that I kind of like go to, is like in my mind. So if I want to like create a piece predominantly using hands, like, all right, we're going to have hands do what they're going to represent. I can throw some flowers in the background and accent them and represent this, that, and the other. Oh, okay, maybe a little elephant, an owl. So it's, it's kind of like I have like a catalog of things to go to, and it's like every piece is just what mixture, what combination of the, those elements will I be using. I think it's funny that you say it's like cheating because <laughs> I don't, I, it's just an interesting way to talk about it because I think every artist, um, we just constantly have that inspiration trailing behind mm -hmm. us. So I don't think it's cheating so much as just you're pulling the art out of the world around you. Yeah. And it's just yeah. sort of threading in the background constantly. Mm -hmm. And then I, I'm always cognitive and um, always looking at other artists and how they create and yeah. what it is that they do, which is why you saw in that dragon piece where you had the different cutaways and different styles. I saw a graffiti artist do something very similar to that. I'm like, how can I take that and express it and flip it into my style and cool. identify with my work? So it's like I always find anything that's inspiration to like, okay, maybe I should challenge myself to do that or something kind of different than that. So, I always, you hear me use that word a lot, challenge. Um, that pretty much comes from my boxing background where I always had to train and challenge myself to be better. And it's kind of like I apply that to my art as well in terms of, all right, this piece needs to be way more tighter. I need to make sure the colors are nice and layered, everything is bright, you know, things like that. So that's, yeah, that's the process behind that. Cool. Um, my day job is in technology. <laughs> and I, you know, obviously there's this whole last several years around kind of truthfulness and factuality and sourcing information all this. And so I guess I was curious, do you feel pressure as an artist, as a storyteller, visual, to, in terms of representing things versus, well, it wasn't, do you get feedback like, well, it wasn't specifically like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, oh, you, when you had like the, some of the images you should, well, even the Mario Kart mm -hmm. one, like, do you, or do you feel like you get any pushback in terms of like, oh, well, surrealism isn't technically, like, photographically true, thus there's a problem with this, like, because I, get, I we hear that in technology a lot, you know, they're around, like, specific data and storytelling and how information is represented. So I was curious if there's any carryover pushback to this type of, of art and storytelling versus, I guess, true fact and how you represent what you need to say. Um, I don't feel like there is, at least I haven't personally ran into it. I feel like it would be a little bit more uh, predominant in technology because I believe with technology you kind of have to be exact, you have to be yeah. precise, especially if you want to come out uh, to a certain end goal with art. You have so much room for error and one of the things people say, and I hate, is that art is subjective. So it's like anybody can feel any way about a certain piece. Someone can paint a red line on this canvas and then you have five lines. Oh my God, that's so fun. And I'll walk out like, what? <laughs> so, you know, 
art is like boundless in terms of that. So with technology, I can definitely see why you would experience that pushback. Me, not necessarily so. And um, honestly, if I did, again, it's art. I have, I have the right to not care. <laughs> yeah, so, sure. yeah. That's good. And that, yeah, yeah. Like, that's healthy too, that that outside, if that outside pressure did exist, it's not impacting your the ability to, to do what you need and want. Yeah, and then it's not always necessarily bad because any outside pushback, it can also be taken as criticism or ways to improve. And I'm always kind of to kind of like separate and discern between the two, like, oh, they're just talking shit. And then, oh, right. no, they're trying to help me. So, you know, I always be mindful of, the, of that as well. So, yeah. Tough. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, if this was your first attempt at public speaking, you got a future, so. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Question, did I hear the first piece, did you say that was a commission piece? Um, yes, the Her Glory piece. Yeah, the, so uh, how, how was, how were you commissioned? How, what, what direction were you given when, when the person came and said, I want you to do this, what did they ask you to do? Um, that was actually one of the types of commissions that I prefer, when people just say, um, I want, me depicting on the piece, but do what you do. That's kind of like what that one was. Like, mm -hmm. the lady, she had a couple details. Um, some that I didn't point out. There were certain tattoos and markings that were on her arm and on her body. The uh, reason she was purple was because of the client. Um, the reason I used the gold pop was because mm -hmm. of the client. Um, so, uh, but those, those are all probably, were those your your observations and your perceptions? Or no, that's that? what she requested. Okay. Specific, okay. The colors and the tattoo markings, and everything outside of that in terms of the aesthetic, how she laid and flowed on the canvas, the placement of the flowers, the huge in the background, that was all. <coughs> yeah. So she gave you an outline and just let you mm -hmm. go from there. Yeah, one of my favorite things with commissions is that I find myself in a place like, damn, why is this with somebody else? Why can't this be mine? <laughs> <laughs> And I feel good when I get that feeling because that's like one of the signs I know, okay, this is done. When I feel like that, oh, I think I can get this. <laughs> I gotta give it up anyway. Is it hard to say goodbye to pieces sometimes? Like One piece in particular, um, two years ago, I sold um, my most expensive commission yet. It was 4000 bucks. Um, the guy paid, over, paid for yeah. it all the time. Um, it was a three-piece uh projects it was like three different canvases yeah. that made one piece um, it was it took me about eight months off and on and between that time i was creating pieces of the lord nostalgia collection um and i tell him anytime that we talk like man thanks for commissioning me for that it leveled me up and in terms cool. of like it helped me mature certain things and styles that I did in that piece for the first time. I'm like, yeah, I need to do that again. Or I need to express this more. Or I can paint horses. <laughs> Stuff like that. So, yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, what are the, so, one of the slides that you were talking about was about like emotions mm -hmm. and um, trials and, and a lot of artists working through, like their, their work is expressing through a lot of those trials. It sounds like it's a lot of pain driven. You use some of the things that you said, like depression, sadness, like, and then how it's, it's therapeutic for those things. Yeah. Um, do you think great art can be made when everything is wonderful? Hell <laughs> yeah! It's kind of harder to do, or do art when you are in a lighter mood versus a darker mood. Honestly, 90% of my art is made from a mood of triumph, a mood of I feel great, I feel good. Um, the Going back to my first slide, I mentioned um, mother and my brother passed from cancer, that was my fuel and motivation to kind of like get started and not let go. But outside of that, everything else has been like the gratification of me seeing something that I like, the gratification of me putting on the internet and getting the five or 500 likes and the gratification of it selling and then seeing that light shine so much, I'm able to just ride off that now. It's like, oh man, I feel great making art. So it's like all of my artwork, it pretty much depicts either a balance or a duality or a triumphant scene or uh, some type of strong message. Um, I never paint skulls, I never paint anything related to death because my mind, spirit, it, it's just never there. It never goes there. Like, literally, like I never have thoughts like, oh man, my life sucks. It's like, and then I have to go back to boxing again because with boxing specifically, it's a one-on-one -on -one contact sport. You're in there, you're responsible for your own well-being. One of the principles that I learned from that and carry on to this day, self-preservation is the first law of nature. 
and I take that and I apply it to literally every day I live and do throughout my life. Another one is uh, proper preparation for this poor performances. So things like that always keep me grounded and make sure I'm like creating with the purpose of feeling good and making sure others feel good as well. It's like, you know, it's, I don't want to say it's impossible for me to feel bad, but thanks to all of that, I rarely have bad feelings and bad times. So literally almost all of my art comes from a good place spiritually in terms of how I'm feeling. Um, if it doesn't, it's a commission and someone wanted a skull or a side fitting or something like that. You know. That's so refreshing just to hear someone creating from a place of joy. Mm -hmm. and because that's my happy place. That's creating, great. You know, like I uh, said in the first slide, like art is all I do. Like that's my nine to five, that's what I have to depend on, that's how I pay for Uber, pay for DTE, all that. So it's <laughs> like I feel good being able to do that. Even though it comes with all sets of stress and struggles because honestly what I do is faith based. Like I have to create to a level and then put it out, put it out, put it out, promote it, promote it, promote it, put myself here in this show and then have faith and have the belief that someone like, you know, I would like to invest in this piece of art or I would like to commission you for a painting. So it's like I have to feel good in order to yeah, kind of like get that energy back. Yeah. It's awesome. All right. All right. Thank you.